Paul said in Ephesians 3, 3 and 4, that it was by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Notice these words carefully. When you read the Bible, you may understand. Have you ever heard someone say, everybody interprets the Bible in a different way? Or you can't expect people in other countries to understand the Bible like you do? Or what a person believes depends on how he was raised and what he was taught. People who grow up Catholic will always see religion through Catholic eyes. Muslims see the world through Islamic eyes. Baptist, Churches of Christ, Mennonites, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others do the same. We all see the world through our own set of lenses. The glasses we wear are just different. Now taken to its logical end, this view would make it very difficult, if not impossible, to know that we have the right interpretation of anything in the scriptures. But did you know that this view is being taught in a more sophisticated way in seminaries and Bible colleges today? Professors in those schools are molding future ministers and missionaries with this kind of mindset. So if you've ever heard a student, let's say, in a Christian university, say something strange about the Bible, or if you've noticed that Bible translations these days are becoming more and more loose, or if you've been shocked at something that a missionary said, and if when you questioned the person, you were told, well, you're just looking at this through your own set of lenses, then this discussion will help you to understand where this idea came from and why it is unbiblical. This view really began to take hold in religious education during the last three or four decades of the 1900s. But if we really want to see where this emphasis came from, we'll have to go back much farther than that. In this discussion, we're about to uncover one of the main sources of this kind of thinking. Now, of course, some people develop this view on their own without the help of a book or a college professor. They just see all the different beliefs in the world and conclude that this diversity is inevitable and unavoidable. But what I'm emphasizing is that the arena of so-called Bible scholarship is full of this theory. And those same supposed scholars who appear to be independent and original thinkers have actually adopted this particular theory from unbelieving philosophers. This way of looking at Bible interpretation, Bible translation, and even mission approaches can be traced back to a prominent German philosopher who lived in the 1700s. So let's do some homework. Let's go back a few hundred years to what many people call the modern period of philosophy in Europe. It was a time of change in thinking about virtually everything. People began to question and doubt things that had been taken for granted for centuries. And one issue that came to the forefront was the question of knowledge. Can we be certain of anything? And if so, how? Does our knowledge come through the mind, that is through reason, or through the physical senses? Now this was logically connected to another key issue. Does anything exist beyond the physical? That is, do we have a soul? Is there really a God? Is there life after death? The medieval European culture, which was dominated by the Catholic Church state at the time, answered with a resounding yes to these questions. But after the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation movement, the dogmatism of the old order gave way to skepticism. The mind-matter problem in ancient Greek philosophy resurfaced. 
and it took center stage in the 1600s and the 1700s. The ancient debate about whether we know through the senses, which is called empiricism, or through reason, which is called rationalism, came to a head in this era. Does knowledge come through the senses, through the mind, through some interaction of both, or through neither? Intellectuals in the modern period gave different answers. For instance, René Descartes said that we can't trust our senses, our physical senses, because sometimes they mislead us. For instance, you see a pencil in a glass of water, and it appears to be broken, but it's not. Or you see what seems to be a pool of water in a road ahead on a very hot day, but when you get closer, you realize that it was just a mirage. So Descartes said that the answer must be with reason itself, not the five senses. He's famous for saying cogito ergo sum, that is, I think, therefore I am. That was his answer to the question of how we can know. Even if you doubt everything else, you can't seriously doubt that you exist because you have to exist to think. So he used that very obvious piece of knowledge as a starting point. Baruch Spinoza was a Jewish philosopher who said that there really is no mind-body or mind-matter problem because only one substance exists. In other words, he was a pantheist. Now, pantheism says that everything is God and God is everything. Now, Spinoza's version of pantheism was different from pantheism in Eastern religions like Buddhism or Hinduism. But it's interesting that his thinking influenced the German philosopher Hegel, who in turn influenced the writings of one Karl Marx. John Locke, on the other hand, in Great Britain, said that knowledge comes through the senses. He's known for saying that at birth, the mind is a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And although he was a devout man who believed in God, he didn't believe that we are born with innate, that is, with inborn ideas about God or about right and wrong. Most people today know about him because he influenced the founders of the United States by his writings. But we're noticing him because he entered into the debate about how we can know. David Hume in Great Britain also gave a more definite answer to the question of knowledge. He said simply, we can't know anything. He was such an extreme skeptic that he said we can only assume even the principle of cause and effect. He said, you really can't prove it. Now, this is why some people today call him the modern day father of skepticism. To Hume, it was impossible to prove that God exists and to Hume, it was just as impossible to prove that God does not exist. Now, all this was the backdrop of the work of one Immanuel Kant. I want you to remember that name, Kant. He's the German philosopher that we alluded to at the beginning of this discussion. He said that Hume's skepticism awakened him out of his dogmatic slumbers. He said Hume and others just assumed, however, that the ideas of experience correspond to the objects of experience. But Kant argued that this is not so. He said that there is a world of sense experience, but when we perceive that world, our mind is structured in such a way that it creates certain impressions about the world. Those ideas that the mind forms may or may not agree with the actual state of things in the world of experience. All you know, Kant said, is the ideas you have in your mind. You can only know how the world appears in your mind. You can't directly perceive it. So there is thus always a difference, an insurmountable and impenetrable wall that separates appearance from reality. Reality is one thing, Kant said. Your perception of it is something else. Now, Kant didn't say that the world is some kind of illusion. He didn't mean that the material world was non-existent. He believed that there is 
an actual world that we see and hear and feel and so forth. But when we take this raw data of the world through the senses, our mind causes us to look at it in certain ways. And Kant called these ways categories. And he says we can know by how we perceive the world through these categories. We can never know the world itself, but only the perceptions that we have of it. Kant believed that our minds see the world through the lenses of space and time and categories of thought such as quantity and quality and relation and modality. And most books about Kant use this kind of illustration. That is, we see the world through a certain set of glasses. We can never remove those lenses because of the way that our minds are structured. That was Kant's theory. Kant said that our mind determines how we see or interpret the world. And he believed that this theory applied to all of mankind and that we inevitably perceive the world in a predetermined way. Now Kant had no intention or interest in influencing Bible interpretation and Bible translation, but his writing eventually did. And Bible translators and Bible interpreters today may not realize that a great deal of translation theory and interpretation theory can be traced back to Kant, but it can. So let's see if we can connect the dots. One philosopher who contributed to this transition was Martin Heidegger. Though his overall philosophy was more existential, his emphasis on the role of pre-understanding, and please remember that terminology, pre-understanding, has had a widespread impact on theology. According to Heidegger, we interpret the world according to how our minds have been preconditioned. Now, we're not at this point talking about interpreting the Bible. That was not Heidegger's or Kant's concern. But Heidegger did think that each of us projects his own world as it exists in our minds onto the actual world. Each person has his or her own context in the world situation, and so every person looks at the same world in a different way. Now here's how Heidegger described his theory. He said, whenever something is interpreted as something, and that's one of the brilliant ways that philosophers have of talking about something very simple, he says the interpretation will be founded essentially upon forehaving, foresight, and foreconception. An interpretation is never a presuppositionless, remember that word presupposition, it's never a presuppositionless apprehending of something presented to us. So while Kant's lenses were the same for everybody, Heidegger's glasses vary according to the individual, but they both believe that conditions of the mind unavoidably affect the way that we interpret the world. So Kant believed that everybody wears the same glasses, but Heidegger thought that everybody's glasses have a different tint. So in the end, the general theory of Kant was passed down to and adapted and applied a century later by a fellow German. Now again, <clears throat> Heidegger was not just talking about how we interpret words. His theory is that the way that we perceive, let's say, music, a song, movies, paintings, nature, or life itself is shaped by our motives, our moods, and our presuppositions. For instance, two people can watch a movie and come away with a completely different opinion about its message. Ten people can listen to the same song and have ten different interpretations of its meaning. Now these perceptions depend on how each person was conditioned to think before that person watched the movie or listened to the song. The key words again here are presupposition and preconception. Heidegger says your mind is preconditioned and that you never interpret anything without these presuppositions. Heidegger's view, which is a modified version of Kant's categories or colored lenses, has had a profound influence on theologians. Now, the next important link in this chain is a theologian who was contemporary with Heidegger. His name is Rudolf Bultmann. 
with him, we see the transition of this thinking from philosophy to religion. Bultmann said that our perception of the world today, and in his time in 1941 when he wrote this, he said it's so radically different from the way that people in the New Testament saw their world that we cannot today possibly understand the writings of the New Testament unless we demythologize it. That is, he meant we have to strip the text of references to demons and miracles and other miraculous phenomena in order to get to the real core message, in his opinion, of the New Testament. Otherwise, we can't relate to their worldview any more than they would be able to appreciate ours. So Bultmann wrote about this in a 1941 essay entitled New Testament and Mythology. Interestingly, Bultmann references Heidegger twice in that article. Some people regard this article as the most controversial and discussed religious writing of the 1900s. Others have said that Bultmann was the most influential theologian of that century. Now, regardless of whether you know a little or a lot about him, there's no doubt that he impacted religious thinking and not in a good way. Most people who know anything about Bultmann realize that he was a liberal theologian who wrote about so-called myths in the Bible. But what many don't know is that his reason for denying the strange world of the New Testament was that he said it is impossible for people in modern times to understand it because of these stories. Bultmann said, we live in a different world today than the world of the first century. And he wrote that in 1941. In that article, Bultmann asked, can Christian proclamation today expect men and women to acknowledge the mythical world picture is true? To do so, he said, would be both pointless and impossible. He insisted that we cannot use electric lights and radios and in the event of illness avail ourselves of modern medical and clinical means and at the same time believe in the spirit and wonder world of the New Testament. And we would ask, why not? The Bible says these miracles were written to lead us to believe. John 20, 30 and 31. But this liberal theologian said that those stories only make the Bible harder to understand. Well, that's a strange accusation. Millions of people have understood those stories from childhood. But many theologians took his basic point about the vast difference between our world and the world of the New Testament. And these schools and scholars have been preaching to us ever since that we should be cautious about saying that we know what the Bible means. Now, of course, they always seem to be able to tell us what it means. Now, let's see how this view of interpretation has come down to us today. One of the areas affected by this thinking is missiology, especially foreign missions. The world, let's put it that way, of evangelists may be very different from the world of the evangelized. For instance, when Christians from a highly industrialized nation like the United States, with its advanced technology and Republican form of government, enter into a third world country, the two cultures can clash. People in the third world nation don't really understand American thinking and Americans don't understand why. Their perspectives are different. In other words, they see through a different set of lenses. They have different customs, different gestures, manners, food, clothing, political thinking, family traditions, and communication. A number of books have been written on this problem. And it's interesting that the same analogy of colored lenses keeps showing up. Also, in addition to these two cultures, there is the culture of the Bible. Now, what I mean by that is simply this. When the evangelists and the evangelized read the Bible, they're not the only ones wearing different glasses, but both sets of glasses are different from the way that people in the Bible saw the world. So this is why many books on mission work and Bible interpretation talk about three horizons. That word is oftentimes used. 
in interpreting and teaching the Bible to others. Mission departments for several decades have used the term contextualization to describe this problem of communication. That is not using the context of the Bible. It's talking about the context of a culture. It explores ways to overcome these cultural and conceptual hindrances. Like other specialized terms, the word contextualization is defined differently by different people. There's nothing wrong with the idea of contextualization as long as it is kept in its biblical context and it's not taken too far. Paul adjusted to cultures where he preached. He said, for instance, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under the law to Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-22. But Paul never compromised the message. It's one thing to accommodate customs that don't affect or violate the doctrine of Christ, but it's another thing to change the doctrine to accommodate a culture. That is something that God forbids. Missionaries sometimes misuse the concept of contextualization to win converts. For instance, the issue of polygamy is an old example in mission work. And a surprising number of schools have told missionaries in training to just ignore the issues. Professors, for instance, say, well, polygamy is just ingrained in their culture and you can't change that. So they tell these future missionaries in training, in some cultures, there's nothing wrong with a man having four wives, so we can't expect them to see marriage like we do. Now, this reasoning is wrong. The New Testament applies to all nations in all times. Jesus told the disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, all nations, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, that is, all nations, to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. God's law of marriage goes back to the beginning of the creation of males and females, and it applies to all, Matthew 19, 3 through 9. Jesus said that there was a concession made in the law of Moses about divorce, but he emphasized that this was not God's original intent for marriage. He went back to Genesis and taught that in this new dispensation today, divorce and remarriage is sinful unless one divorces a mate for the cause of fornication. In the same way, polygamy was temporarily allowed in the Mosaic law. But today, under the New Testament, every man is allowed to have his own wife, not wives. 1 Corinthians 7, 2, Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. Listen to what one professor in a Christian university said about this. He was talking about culture and doctrine while he was conducting a seminar on the role of women according to the Bible. He advocated women preachers and women elders, and he even suggested that women going topless in some cultures is not wrong. He said, quote, Any attempt for us to discuss this topic without presupposition, have you seen that word before? It's probably going to be useless because we have all grown up in an environment which has given us the feelings that we have. So he said, I'm going to discuss this matter first of all, from a bit of a historical perspective before we get to the text because, like it or not, the historical perspectives are the lenses through which we view these texts. And we just need to be honest with ourselves. And sometimes that's one of the hardest things in the world to do, is to reckon that something that I have always felt was deeply rooted in the Bible is really nothing more than the way I grew up. 
Because on almost every one of these texts, you see, you could say it's clear as a bell what the text teaches. But frankly, on every one of these texts, there are a variety of ways of looking at that depending on your glasses. End of quote. And I would say, then why on earth is he trying to teach anybody anything at all? If he can't be sure, then why is he so dogmatic that the rest of us can't be sure? This reminds me of the ancient sophists in the days of Socrates. They were paid teachers who argued that everything is relative. They said that there is no absolute truth. And yet, they were teaching other people. And here we are, 2,500 years later, and the same thing is happening in universities. Even worse, it's being taught in religion. Now, people are different, but they're not that different. Human nature is basically the same anywhere you go. Paul said, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Anyone, anywhere can know that God exists, for instance, because the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Psalm 19, verse 1. In fact, this display of God is universal. There is no speech or language in any nation where the voice of nature is not heard. Psalm 19, verse 3. He is not far from each one of us, Acts 17, 27. And because of this revelation in the creation, people can know by nature, by nature itself, that some things are right and others are wrong, Romans 2, 14 and 15. For instance, Paul taught in Romans 1, 26 and 27, that homosexuality, men with men and women with women, is against nature itself. Then there are things like murder and lying, which are basically considered to be wrong in any culture. So, in spite of our differences in culture, we do have many things in common as human beings. We all have the same basic nature. And we all have the same lenses available to us. It's our choice as to whether or not we use them. Now, this overemphasis on the way that people perceive the Bible was bound to affect a second part of our study, and that is Bible translation. The last half of the 20th century brought a new emphasis on clarifying language in the Bible because translators felt that some readers would get the wrong idea. They said the words of Scripture had to be adjusted because of the ways that people see them. In other words, translators began to be more sensitive to the reader's colored glasses, and they began to make adjustments to the text accordingly. And this has given rise to an explosive growth in the number of Bible translations available. Many translators now say that people will misunderstand the Bible if you translate it literally. The Bible, they say, might be taken the wrong way because of how people have been conditioned to think. This approach has been labeled in different ways. It's been called dynamic equivalence or functional equivalence. Sometimes these translations are called idiomatic translations, but whatever terminology is used, the underlying concern, which is understandable, is to make the translation less literal so that it will become more understandable. Communicating the gospel from one culture to another involves translating from one language into another. And it's not as easy as you might think. For instance, years ago, Missionaries went to remote places with a history of cannibalism. Now, how should they have translated a passage like John 6, verse 53? That's where Jesus talked about eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of Man. Or consider a less shocking example. Some people in tropical countries have never seen snow. So how can they relate to Isaiah 1, verse 18, which says that the people's sins would be white as snow. And what about Jewish customs in the New Testament, like Corban in Mark 7, 11, and the wearing of phylacteries in Matthew 23, verse 5? Can non-Jews today appreciate these words, or will these strange terms hinder the communication process? Do these expressions need to be adjusted or even replaced to make them understandable? Now, it's impossible 
to deal with even the most fundamental aspects and issues of Bible translation in this discussion. That's not my purpose. I'm showing how liberal theologians have adversely affected this field. And I'm saying that the source of much of this thinking goes back to the modern period of philosophy and especially to the work of one man in particular. We live in a postmodern world, that is, in an age where most people take for granted the views of the modern age of philosophy, which covered roughly the late 1500s, the 1600s, and the 1700s. Now that mindset that we inherited from that period is one of skepticism about knowing anything. But that being said, let's comment briefly on the questions that we just raised. The Bible is God's inspired word, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. The more that a translator believes that, the more careful he will be when he translates the Bible. In regard to John 6, 53, there's no need and there's certainly no biblical authority for omitting the offensive or even potentially dangerous expressions about eating Jesus' flesh and drinking His blood. We should translate those words as closely as possible in the receptor language. It's up to the missionaries to use good judgment about when and where to use these verses. Don't we do the same today with some passages, for instance, in the Song of Solomon in mixed audiences? It's also the teacher's responsibility to explain these scriptures. And it is also the hearer's duty to listen honestly and to understand it as God intended. Now in regard to people who live in warm climates who have never seen snow, translators again should translate Isaiah 1 verse 18 with the equivalent term in the receptor language or use the closest possible term. The same is true with words like Corban or phylactery or any other word that may sound unfamiliar in some areas today. We have no right to deviate from God's Word. Once we go down the road of adjusting the wording of the Bible because it may sound strange to our ears or to someone else's, there will be no end to how much it will be revised. It is impossible to put everything in the Scriptures into the framework of current understanding. And attempting to do so is not even good for us. One of the beauties of studying Bible history is learning to relate to things that we have never experienced. And if we have to experience something before we can relate to it culturally, then how can we relate to heaven or hell? Translators today stress two challenges to the work of translating. Keeping the translation accurate to the original text and making it understandable to the reader. And there should be a good balance between these two concerns and that is difficult. However, the trend in recent decades has been to make the translation understandable at the expense of keeping it as accurate as possible to the original text. And I'm saying that the idea that our lenses unavoidably interfere with our understanding has amplified rather than clarified this difficulty. So this has become more and more the case with English translations of the Bible. The gender issue, for instance, is the most obvious example. For centuries, Bible readers understood that the English word man is both a generic and a specific term, depending on the context. It can mean a male in contrast to a female, but it can also refer to mankind as a whole human beings in general, both male and female. The women's liberation movement and the unisex philosophy of the 1970s and the 1980s created a prejudiced concept of the word man. The feminist movement in politics and culture affected theology and Bible translators followed suit. For instance, in 1990, the preface to the new revised Standard Version, complained about the danger of linguistic sexism arising from the inherent bias of the English language towards the masculine gender. The NRSV also said its goal 
was that masculine-oriented language should be eliminated as far as possible. Five years later, the Oxford University Press released the New Testament and Psalms, which they called an inclusive version. Now, the introduction says that it was based on the NRSV. It sought to, quote, replace or rephrase all gender-specific language not referring to particular historical individuals, all pejorative references to race, color, or religion, and all identifications of persons by their physical disability alone, by means of paraphrase, alternative renderings, and other acceptable means of conforming the language to the work of an inclusive idea. The introduction says the translators removed masculine pronouns like he, him, and his. It removed the word Father for God and substituted, unbelievably, God our Father-Mother. It removed Son of God for Jesus and put Child of God. It replaced the Son of Man with the Human One. So this so-called translation went to even more ridiculous extremes by replacing the word king with ruler or sovereign for God and even eliminated words like dark and darkness because dark-skinned people might find these words offensive. In 2001, Zondervan released a more gender-neutral edition of the NIV which they call today's New International Version, now known simply as the NIV. The Translation Committee noted that many diverse and complex cultural forces, which continue to bring about subtle shifts in the meanings and or connotations of even old, well-established words and phrases, as a result, these translators aimed at, quote, the elimination of most instances of the generic use of masculine nouns and pronouns. He, him, and his were replaced with they, them, and theirs. The NIV has always been more of an idiomatic translation than evangelicals said it was, but this revision created a backlash of criticism even from several parts of the evangelical camp. It's interesting, however, that these gender-neutral versions often don't follow their policy in 1 Peter 5, 8. That's the verse that says the devil walks as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But most of those translations use the masculine pronoun he, not she or it, to refer to the devil. You even see this change in Greek grammars and Greek lexicons. For instance, in 1950, Broadman Press published the book Essentials of New Testament Greek by Ray Summers. The definition of the Greek word anthropos in that edition was simply man. That's the only uh, listing for that word. But in the 1995 revision of that book, the book defined that same word anthropos as person, human being, and only lastly as man. The widely used Greek lexicon known as Bauer or Art and Gingrich or BAGD followed suit. In 2000, this Greek English dictionary for the first time showed marks of the gender neutral trend. It listed the Greek word pater, the word for father, but it gave parent as an equivalent meaning. It also suggested that the word adelphos, the word for brother, could be translated in the plural form brothers and sisters. So even the field of so-called Greek scholarship has been tainted with this approach. As the early years of this century progressed, political correctness, ecumenical theology, and homosexual transgender ideology led to further disregard for what the Bible says. The only thing that matters now is how people take the Bible based on how they feel. Activists in these areas often feel no responsibility to give any kind of rational defense of their views of the Bible. But when they do, they usually talk like Bultmann, Heidegger, or Kant. The theological basis of this shift 
is rooted in postmodern thinking. It places an emphasis on how a text is perceived, and that goes all the way back to Kant. So in a way, it was political correctness that led to this transition. But underneath was the, the same old theory, the idea that people today look at these concepts in different ways than people in the Bible looked at them, or in different ways than people did in times of older translations. People now see through a different set of lenses, and adjustments have to be made according to the text. Now, if the effect of Kant on mission theory and translation theory is not clear yet, there will be absolutely no question in the field of Bible interpretation or hermeneutics. This is where Kant's emphasis on appearance and reality comes into full view. It will also become clear that Heidegger's emphasis on pre-understanding has had a major influence in the arena of Bible interpretation. Do you remember the quote from Heidegger we looked at a few minutes ago? Would you be surprised that this very section is quoted in a book on interpreting the Bible? Here's what the author wrote. He said, according to Heidegger, interpretation is always grounded in three things. Something we have in advance afore having, something we see in advance a foresight, and something we grasp in advance, a foreconception. In a section entitled, The Role of Pre-Understanding, he says, every reader approaches a text under the guidance of a perspective. Any text is read, perceived, and interpreted within a pre-existent structure of reality. All understanding and interpretation proceed from a prior understanding or a system of making sense of reality. There is no such thing as a pre-reading and objective interpretation. Really? If there's no such thing as an objective interpretation, then how are we supposed to interpret what he just said in this book? If our minds are so preconditioned when we read the Bible, wouldn't that same pre-understanding be there when we read his book? Still, another book on Bible interpretation objects to the idea of reading the Bible without preconceived ideas or not being able to really see through them. He says, such thinkers as Martin Heidegger, this is a book on Bible interpretation, such thinkers as Martin Heidegger, for example, have forced us to take seriously the role that pre-understanding plays in the process of interpretation. None of us is able to approach new data with a blank mind. And so our attempts to understand new information consist largely of adjusting our prior framework of understanding, integrating the new into the old. This is absurd. Martin Heidegger did not force us to admit this. These writers talk like no one ever considered the impact of prejudice and preconceived ideas before men like Heidegger and Bultmann. The truth is, gospel preachers have been saying this all along. They've been saying that the reason people don't understand the Bible is because they will not give up what they have been taught. Under the heading, Language and pre-understanding. Another writer of a book on interpretation says this. He says, it is well known that Rudolf Bultmann, among others, has repudiated the idea that an interpreter can understand, and he has that in quotation marks, the New Testament independently of his own prior questions. The demand that the interpreter must silence his subjectivity in order to attain an objective knowledge is therefore the most absurd one that can be imagined. Now these books reveal the shift that has occurred in Bible interpretation in the last 50 to 75 years. And that change has been from a text, a Bible text-centered approach, to a reader-centered approach. Some would add a third factor, the author of the Bible book in question, and would call it an author-centered approach. 
But since what we know about the human author of the Bible comes from the text, I'm not granting the need for that distinction. Besides, the Holy Spirit is the real author of Bible books. Sadly, however, some books on Bible interpretation don't even accept the divine inspiration of the Scriptures. Now, the books that we've just examined are from Protestant writers. Now let's get closer to home for some of you. At the same time this view became popular in the 1980s and the 1990s, churches of Christ began to sing the same tune. A preacher, for instance, in Texas at a lectureship in 1988 held up a copy of a tract entitled, Can We Understand the Bible Alike? And he said that that was just an ignorant view. He referenced the book, Unexpected News, Reading the Bible with Third World Eyes. And he said, I guarantee you that people who live in a third world country don't read the Bible like you do. Now this same kind of talk dominated what is called the Christian Scholars Conference in 1988, 1989, and 1990. These speakers and writers took the basic idea of contextualization in Protestant circles and adapted it to what they considered to be restoration hermeneutics. The charge was that we had been reading the Bible through restorationist glasses. Also, in 1990, the book The Cruciform Church from Abilene Christian University jumped on this theological bandwagon. This book talked about the role of pre-understanding. I w wonder where he ever got that idea. Where did he come up with that terminology? He said that it was some kind of new insight. It pretended to be that kind of innovation, at least. It never acknowledged the source of this thinking, but it was just a progressive Church of Christ version of what these other Protestant books were saying at the time. It was the same old Kant, Heidegger, Bultmann twist on pre-understanding and presuppositions. Now, the writers and speakers that we're referring to were all just parroting what these liberal theologians had said. They all used the same language. They began talking about the need for a new hermeneutic. That phrase had been used in Protestant circles years earlier to refer to an approach that was admittedly different. But this so-called new hermeneutic was a call for a different perspective on interpretation. Most exposés of this new hermeneutic in Churches of Christ missed the point of it. It was never really a hermeneutic. It argued that the way that Campbell and Stone and others interpreted the Bible made the Scriptures into a cold, mechanical set of propositions instead of a book that addresses the hearts and the lives of people. In other words, the whole movement, called the New Hermeneutic Movement back in those days, argued that we need to throw away those old glasses that are distorted by restoration thinking and put on a better set of glasses. But these people did very little to tell us what the Scriptures actually mean. They were too busy telling us that we had it wrong to do that. And they never really came up with a clear way to better understand the Bible. I believe they actually made Bible interpretation more complicated. And also, they assumed that many of us just blindly accepted everything that American Restoration preachers had said or written. In the end, this new hermeneutic movement was largely negative and past-oriented rather than positive and forward-looking. But this was the popular trend in the last two decades of the 1900s. Sad to say, this thinking did not die out with that trend. In fact, now, in many colleges and seminaries, it's a given. There's not as much effort to prove it because it's just accepted as fact. So because of the influence of Kant, as it was passed down through Heidegger, Bultmann, and others, the focus of many studies in hermeneutics, regrettably and tragically, has little to do with the actual text of the Bible. The emphasis is on the psyche of the reader. If you pick up a book on Bible interpretation, let's say written in the 1800s or the first half of the 1900s, 
you'll likely find that it's centered on how to interpret the Bible. Figures of speech, historical background, original languages, the importance of context, the different levels of context, and so forth. But if you pick up a book on the subject of Bible interpretation written from, let's say, the 1980s or the 1990s on to our time, you'll see a discussion of the different kinds of readers of the Bible. Older books on Bible interpretation analyzed the Bible. Now, those books on Bible interpretation psychoanalyze the reader. So to a degree, the field of secular psychology has contributed to the view that we're looking at. Secular psychologists say the cause of human behavior is basically either heredity or environment, some kind of physical cause. And of course, that leaves out free will, free choice. It also leaves out personal responsibility. B.F. Skinner, for instance, was one of the founders of the behaviorist approach to psychology. Behaviorism says that one's environment causes him to act the way that he does. So it's no exaggeration to say that the view that we're looking at is actually a behavioristic theology of interpretation. And what has been the result? Really, less genuine Bible study and less Bible knowledge and less confidence in the Word of God. And this is inevitable. It is impossible to spend most of one's time on theories of understanding and theories about Bible interpretation and at the same time devote yourself to the practical study of God's Word. And yet this is the trend still in many seminaries and theological journals, all under the auspices of intellectualism and scholarship. Oh, there is Bible study today, but because of theories like the one that we're looking at, people tend to be like those in 2 Timothy 3 verse 7. They are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Do presuppositions play a role in how people interpret the Bible? Yes, of course. Our feelings and our thoughts affect the way that we read the Bible. But that doesn't mean we can't see through them. That doesn't mean that we have to succumb to those prejudices. That doesn't mean that pre-understanding determines our interpretation. We may be affected by our presuppositions, but we're not imprisoned by them. And by the way, what a hopeless message it is to say that we cannot escape their grip. Does that sound like the good news of the gospel to preach this kind of theory to people? So the question is, has God given us the mind and the conscience to see through our faulty pre-understanding and to help other people to do the same? The answer is yes. We can understand the Bible. Let's go back to where we started. Paul told the Ephesians at Ephesus that it was by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, Paul said that God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants every person to know the truth. The question that remains is, is God able to communicate to us in a way that we can understand? Jesus certainly did not teach what these theologians are teaching. Consider the Pharisees. If any group in the New Testament had a preconceived way of looking at the Bible, they did. And yet consider how Jesus taught them. He told the Pharisees, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, Matthew 9, 13. Those words are from Hosea 6, verse 6. They were written hundreds of years before Jesus said them. And they had been read by many generations of Jews. The Pharisees were actually a more recent group of Jews in this history. And they had their own way of looking at the Old Testament. They believed that the scriptures should be interpreted in light of their oral traditions. That is what they taught their disciples. They were very strong in this approach to interpretation. But that was no excuse for their misunderstandings. It was no justification 
for them to teach false doctrines. Jesus rebuked them and he told them just to read this scripture. Now, does that sound like they couldn't take off their Pharisaic glasses? And if those lenses were so thick that a person can hardly see through them, then how can you explain the fact that Paul, Nicodemus, and Zacchaeus were able to see through their Pharisaic traditions? Then consider the Sadducees. They were conditioned not to believe in the resurrection. They had their own interpretation of the Old Testament. They had arguments against the idea of life after death. Yet when they made their case to Jesus, he said, Have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Matthew 22, verse 31. So Jesus quoted the Bible to them and expected them to understand it. Their Sadducean glasses were not permanently attached. They could have removed them. After his resurrection, Jesus had a conversation with two of his disciples as they walked toward Emmaus. This is Luke 24. They were discouraged and doubtful that he had been raised from the dead. So Jesus rebuked them, he said, for being slow to believe what the Old Testament prophets had written about him. Then, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, verse 27. He expected both of them to understand these passages in the same way. Why would Jesus do this if each person interprets the Bible differently and can't avoid doing so? You see, the Lord never said something like this. Well, Moses lived in a different situation at a different time. He wrote under different circumstances. So did David. So did Isaiah. So did others in the Old Testament scriptures. Customs today in our time are not the same as they were then. The language has changed. And the political situation, well, that's much different. So what Moses said in the Ten Commandments, or what David wrote, had a different meaning then than it has now. And that's not what we find at all. Jesus quoted the Old Testament freely, especially in Matthew. And he applied it to people in his day, in his culture, and he expected people to understand it. The real colored glasses that people wore in Jesus' day were the ones that they chose to wear. Stubbornness, prejudice, pride. But anyone with a good and honest heart could see clearly Luke 8, verse 15. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. He said, if anyone wants to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority, John 7, 17. People could understand Jesus. That's why the Bible says the common people heard him gladly, Mark 12, verse 37. The truth is, if you believe Jesus, you cannot believe Kant, Heidegger, Bultmann, and all of these modern theologians that follow them. We can recognize and th see through our own prejudice and our own preconceived ideas. Thousands of Jews did this when the church was established. In Acts 2, Peter and other apostles taught a mixed audience of Jews. They came from different countries. They spoke different languages. They lived in different cultures. Some were Jews by birth and others were proselytes. Some in the audience accused the apostles of being drunk. In general, they had supported the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So it would be safe to say that on Pentecost Day, their minds were preconditioned. And yet, when they heard the preaching of the gospel that went against their pre-understanding, they changed their thinking and 3,000 of them were baptized. Now, can you imagine what would have happened if Peter had said something like this? Well, I know that you and I see this whole thing through a different set of lenses, so I can't tell you that my version of truth is right and yours is wrong. After all, we're the products of our surroundings. How absurd. Also, Jews in the first century throughout the kingdom 
of, of, of God saw Old Testament prophecy and looked at it as a political empire with an earthly king. That's how they interpreted Old Testament prophecy. They believed the kingdom of Isaiah, Daniel, and other books would be a political empire with an earthly king. Now, if there was ever a case of a strong presupposition and preconditioning, it was the Jewish conception of the kingdom. They'd been taught that since they were children. The great scholars believed it. The nation of Israel longed for a new day and a better kingdom. Did it take a while for them to remove these colored glasses and see the kingdom as it really was, a spiritual kingdom, the church? Yes. Did it happen? Yes. Now, if the Jews could see through their presuppositions about the kingdom, there's no excuse for people today saying that we can't read the Bible objectively. Jews in the New Testament had also been preconditioned not to associate with Gentiles. Acts 10, verse 28. But the gospel enabled them to see through this thick racial barrier. Was this hard? Yes. Was it impossible? No. These two groups could not have been more different in many ways. But they could lay aside those old prejudices if they chose to. Paul plainly explained this in Ephesians 2, verse 11 through chapter 3, verse 6. Now, of course, some Jews did not remove their colored glasses. Paul called the prejudice of unbelieving Jews a veil, a veil that kept them from understanding the Old Testament. That's in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 15. But could they have removed the veil if they chose to? Yes, many of them did. But what about the Gentiles? What about the Gentiles in the New Testament? In the first century world, the Gentile mind had been preconditioned with superstitions, mythology, idolatry, strange customs, prejudice toward the Jews, ungodly rituals, a different philosophical and political outlook, and numerous other influences. But many of the Gentiles heard and understood the gospel and obeyed the gospel. When Paul preached in the pagan city of Corinth, the Bible says, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. Acts 18, verse 8. And what about those in Thessalonica who had been preconditioned to accept idol worship? Paul said that they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. Now someone might say, well, but what about the problems? in congregations with Gentile members because of how they had been taught? And what about the conflict between Jews and Gentiles in the church? Well, yes, it's true that there were problems. The differences in culture and pre-understanding or preconditioning or whatever you want to call it, those differences cause friction. Yes, there were conflicts in the churches of the New Testament, but that's why the epistles were written. Now, was it a useless idea for the Holy Spirit to send those letters to churches? You see, there's almost no end of the levels to which this overemphasis can be applied and is actually being applied. If people can't be expected to understand the Bible because of different cultures, then how can they be expected to overcome the bias of different subcultures, different races, different economic levels, or different political thinking? different dialects, different genders, different age groups, different body types, different personality types, different family relations and experiences, and the list could go on and on. If the view that we're looking at is true, we would have to custom design the gospel for every individual. We would also have to tailor make a different version of the Bible for every individual. And maybe this is one reason why so many churches are turning away from the Bible and turning to a more charismatic religion. If they can't really take these glasses off and agree on the Bible, then they just seem to appear to think it's better to say that God speaks to them directly. Then each person ends up with his own personalized revelation from God. But still, if the theory that we're talking about is true, wouldn't the same colored glasses still be there? But it gets even worse. When this theory 
is taken to its logical end. I'm talking about the old illustration of the glasses and pre-understanding. If you take that to its logical end, the result is a very ecumenical, coexistent pluralism. According to this interpretation, no one religion can say that it has the truth. That's because Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, and atheists are conditioned by their environment. Consider a book by John Hick called An Interpretation of Religion. In that book, he argued that the world is ambiguous. People interpret the world in different ways. The universe is one, but people perceive it in various ways. One person might say God created it. Another might say that God and the world are the same. Another may say that the world is the work of many gods. Another may say that there is no creator or creators. It came from nothing and evolved. Others are agnostic about it, and they just suspend judgment. The evidence, the world, is ambiguous, according to Hick. It is interpreted or perceived by each one according to his own way of looking at things. Now listen very carefully. Hick does not hesitate to tell us that he got this idea from Kant. He said, quote, In developing this thesis, our chief philosophical resource will be one of Kant's most basic epistemological insights. He got it from Kant. But then let's consider the area of morals. If the theory that we're looking at is true, then every man sees right and wrong according to the glasses that he's wearing. So in the end, every person has his own interpretation of the world, his own interpretation of God, his own interpretation of the Bible, and his own interpretation of morality. Now I ask you, where is any kind of personal responsibility and accountability to God in all this? You see, there's virtually no talk among these writers about the power of the Word of God. They don't talk about that. They simply talk about our inability. The Bible is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4, verse 12. These books don't build trust in the power of the Bible. It is ironic that the same theologians who preach to us about our presuppositions have their own presuppositions. We've seen that many of these writers have been preconditioned by Kant, Heidegger, and others. In other words, they've been preconditioned about preconditioning. They have presuppositions about presuppositions. How is it that they can see through their pre-understanding, but we can't, at least not without their help? And if they admit that their views of the subject are just opinions formed by their environment or their own horizon of understanding, then why are they so dogmatic? And why should we listen to them? After all, the same bias that clouds our mind when we read the Bible according to them would also distort our understanding when we read their books. And yet they consistently talk as if their writing is so clear that everyone should understand it. These men say our glasses are colored. Could it be their glasses are not as clear as they think? This thinking is nothing more than agnosticism. According to this reasoning, we can't know the truth. We can only know how we perceive it. That is agnosticism. And yet, like other agnostics, they speak as if they are very sure and talk as if their conclusions are facts. The impact of Kant's thinking is well stated by Edward J. Young in his book, Thy Word is Truth. He said, we do not actually get to the heart of things until we first realize that much of modern theological thought is, whether consciously or not, based upon the philosophical thought of Kant. That influence is still felt to this very day. Thank God he has given us a Bible that even children can understand. Sure, there are some things hard to understand in the scriptures. Peter admitted that in 2 Peter 3.16, but he didn't say they are impossible to know. He also said some things are hard to understand, not everything. Thank God we can see the truth. So let us take comfort in these words of the Bible. 
Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. There's just something about